Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to this uh, edition of the Marxist Classes. Uh, tonight's class is uh, Resistance Popcorn Edition, Zombies, Jedi, and the Fight Against Fascism. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a moment here. We'll give people a, a couple more minutes to, uh, to sign on. So we are uh, we're joined tonight by uh, our uh, facilitators Chauncey K. Robinson and uh, Michelle P. Kern. Uh, Chauncey is an editor, uh, journalist, and film critic at the People's World. Uh, she also reviews movies and TV for uh, Rotten Tomatoes, um, and you can also catch her on our YouTube channel, Twisted Girl Next Door. Uh, where she dives into uh, commentary and analysis on horror uh, movies and TV. Uh, um, and uh, so check her out there and, and uh, subscribe. Um, Michelle is a, an artist and an art educator. She teaches ceramics in the San Mateo Community College District, where she's been since 2006. Um, She's also, she also spent a long time in the Bay Area where she worked with the Richmond Art Center and helped found the independent gallery uh, Cricket Engine. Uh, Michelle writes for PW and for the CPUSA website. Um, and uh, she, uh, she covers issues ranging from women's rights to free speech, Marxism, and uh, of course, uh, Star Wars, um, which is what she'll talk about tonight. So, uh, I think we're going to give it maybe two more minutes, and then uh, I will hand it over to um, uh, which one of you would like to start? Michelle is starting. OK, wonderful. Thank you. So um, our, our topic tonight is uh, sort of resistance at the movies. Um, what makes movies political? Um, what role do movies play in, in political culture? Um, uh, we expect that there will be a, a, a lot of discussion. It's a pretty exciting topic. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, you can use the uh, raised hand uh, button on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, just raise your hand and we'll be able to call on you. Uh, you can also uh, type in a question um, and we will uh, do our best to transmit that to Chauncey and Michelle. Um, see, uh, I think that takes care of the uh, logistics. So I'm going to quiet down and turn it over to uh, Michelle Kern. All right, well, thanks, Scott. And hello, everybody. Uh, happy to be here joining you tonight to talk about Star Wars. So think of some questions for us at the end. That'll be exciting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the political situation of Star Wars, just kind of how it's developed, how it reflects the um, kind of the politics, the time it was uh, created in, and other topics that kind of relate to that. So um, although Star Wars is generally more popular for its space mythology with uh, good versus evil, swordsmen, heroes, monsters, and princesses, it has always uh, also been political. So each of the three trilogies uh, have a certain focus of their own on the dangers that can threaten democracy. So George Lucas, uh, the creator of Star Wars, he began writing it in 1973 and uh, really kind of took up his opinions of current events at that time, especially the Watergate political scandal, which really influenced the political subtext of the first trilogy, which they call the original trilogy. So a quote from him about that says, it was really about the Vietnam War, and that was the period where Nixon was trying to run for a second term, which got me to thinking historically about how do democracies get turned into dictatorships? Uh, because the democracies aren't overthrown, they're given away. 
Uh, so his model for the emperor, who's the villain in the original trilogy and the other trilogy, the prequel trilogy, is Emperor Palpatine and Richard Nixon was used as the model. So he's the senator turned evil empire. And it's this character which really dominated the story as a symbol of corrupted power over the two trilogies. So the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. And the model for the Republic government that's portrayed was really the United States. And it's portrayed as a government as crisis that is then transformed into the oppressive empire that was ruled by Palpatine. So in the prequel trilogy, uh, Palpatine as a Senator, he's slowly revealed as a secret influence and shadowy force who kind of destabilizes the Republic uh, beside, you know, behind the scenes in order to take power. But the power, you know, the motive for it isn't really defined. It's kind of like power itself is supplied as the motive. And he's kind of a muster, mustache twirling villain, you know, it's kind of like evil versus good. Um, but he uh, has this motive to take power, um, to take the political leadership, and he really subverts democracy in an effort to do that. So leading on from that, um, with the original trilogy being about the Vietnam era and how the democracy can turn into a dictatorship, uh, the prequel trilogy then, which is the later films of the late 90s and early 2000s, it really delved even further into this theme, you know, kind of even accurately predicting several elements of uh, Bush era conservative legislative ploys, um, kind of like the Patriot Act, the pursuit of war in order to maximize profits to, and to keep the populace in a state where they would trade democracy for this feeling of safety. And it also kind of highlighted the increased influence of corporations on our political process and really the expansion of the military industrial complex. So in the prequel trilogy, which has a lot of complicated subplots, but kind of the political plot is that Palpatine and his political clique, they use various kind of complicated strategies all with the purpose of uh, fomenting dissatisfaction within the Republic and then taking advantage of that dissatisfaction and the people's loss of uh, faith and confidence in the Senate, which, uh, you know, that body proves to be pretty powerless when they're faced with this conflict in need of resolution. So instead of action, um, the factions in this government kind of come to an impasse with the influence of the Trade Federation which is a political caucus in the Senate made up of corporate entities which kind of corrupt and subvert the ideals of the Republic um, for its own aims and for profit, obviously. And then in the midst of this uh, kind of vacuum of leadership, Palpatine arranges to have himself elected Supreme Chancellor using the tools of that democracy and a really cynical power grab. Now it's interesting, then we kind of catch up uh, with the current trilogy, the films that are being made now. Uh, those are called the sequel trilogy and uh, this kind of catch up with the main old characters of the original trilogy. Um, you know, you kind of see from the end of the original trilogy, Princess Leia, who's the heroine and the leader, you know, her band of rebels had kind of vanquished the 19 year reign of Palpatine and the Galactic Empire and everything's supposed to be fine. The new government's reestablished along the lines of the old Republic and then it's just referred to as the new Republic. So um, they just kind of, you know, take the, the old government and recreate it into this new government. Um, but then the movies themselves kind of give scant information on what happened to create the conflict that's happening now, because of course it's Star Wars. So there's this aggressive threat, it's called the First Order. And then there's the new rebels, they're called the Resistance. And, um, you know, so there's this ongoing fight going on as soon as the first movie starts, which is the Force to, Force Awakens of the sequel trilogy. So, and some of the supplementary materials, um, they go into more detail. So um, this is a great novel called Bloodline uh, by Claudia Gray, which um, it goes in a much greater uh, depth. It kind of describes the state of the galactic government six years before the events of the first film of the sequel trilogy. And it's written from Leia's point of view, and show that the new Republic has taken on all the problems that existed in the old Republic. So from, you know, if you're looking from a, a Marxist point of view, you know, it shows that the, the weakness of the new state is formed on the structure of the old one. And there's no like revolutionary effort at radical restructuring in order to do away with that system. And they're just replicating the conflicts that destabilized the uh, previous uh, governmental system. 
And so it's kind of this inability to deal with the underlying class issues that existed in the galaxy that leads to the same failures again. It's kind of interesting because I was looking around and it's like, are there, are there class politics in Star Wars? I mean, Star Wars has been around forever. And uh, when I was looking around, there's some interesting research. And in 2012, um, in an interview, Lucas said, well, I'm a very ardent believer in democracy, but, um, you know, not capitalist democracy. And I do not believe that the rich should be able to buy the government. And so, you know, Lucas kind of originally intended this vague critique of capitalism, militarism, and empire in his films, but it's pretty subtle. And then in the sequel trilogy, this critique is less subtle and the supplementary narratives, they also show kind of more of the underlying exploitation that exists in the galaxy. So it's made much more clear that it's definitely like imperialist, capitalist exploitation that motivates this lust for power by both the empire and, um, you know, later the first order. So the villains that we have now. And so um, it's kind of interesting that they're kind of surfacing these issues more. Like there's this young adult novel also by Claudia Gray, Leia, Princess Alderaan. It kind of deals with her development as a political leader and future rebel in the story uh, that predates the original trilogy. So she's on this humanitarian mission uh, to this planet Wobani, and this planet has uh, suffered under this imperial economic program called the Commodities Enhancement Program, which is kind of like a neoliberal economic program that the IMF and the World Bank often, often imposes on other countries. And so this is kind of a great quote. It says, well, Bonnie was given impossible quotas to film, fill, and when the planet's farmers fell short, they were fined. Large areas of common land were instead parceled out to various imperial officers who would supposedly put them under better management. Really, this meant they could now profit while the native Wobani became even poorer and hungrier. Every world targeted by the commodities program suffered, but Wobani had entirely collapsed. Famine was now widespread. As the agricultural sector faltered, the factory cities became overcrowded with desperate migrants in search of work, which, meant, which in turn meant that the factories could pay lower wages and force people to labor in more dangerous conditions. And so Leia, Princess Leia observes that the planet's economy is suffering such intense structural damage from this program that the imperial leadership is considering instituting prison labor camps, which would then be the planet's main industry. And this classic imperial economic exploitation and oppression really spurs Leia to this growing rage against the cruelty of the empire and uh, kind of spurs her to go even beyond political solutions and she sort of enters into the military leadership in the uh, rebellion a few years later. And so, you know, she also takes up this leadership position in the New Republic. Um, but they kind of, like I said, they kind of replicate the same problems. There's two factions. They don't really see eye to eye. Um, they can't really solve problems and they become kind of impotent. Um, and so, it's a conflict that these two factions in the New Republic um, that kind of leads to the same inertia and political impotency that plagued the old Republic. And uh, rather than working out their differences and eventually coming to a decision on action to take, um, they've kind of, you know, distrust each other and thwart any propositions or actions. And in the meantime, there's this rising threat of the First Order who are kind of forged from the disgruntled remnants of the Empire uh, they're holdovers who are really resent having been toppled from power by the rebels and they've kind of been waiting for their opportunity to rise again and destabilize the government to regain power. It's interesting, um, this time they're a little more direct. Um, they take advantage of the weaknesses of the democratic processes to destabilize it, destabilize it but um, they're doing more with kind of like outright terrorism and gangsterism. They're creating alliances with pirates and criminal families to shake down these galactic outposts for protection um, from threats that they themselves are first creating. So they're really kind of more of this outlaw faction that's trying to uh, gain power in the Republic um, and probably rebuild the empire. 
But it's interesting because they're also able to build up funding via support from these kind of autonomous corporate sector authority, which are the corporations of the galaxy. Um, they're also supplementing their income with um, their criminal enterprises, so they're getting money from that. Um, so, you know, there's kind of some interesting surfacing and detail that's coming about. Um, you know, and it's it, even though, um, you know, the new republic is kind of flawed, you know, people are trying to defend it, and that's kind of how the resistance comes into being. Leia takes leadership on that, and uh, she's got this kind of extra legal body that she's formed with people where um, she's trying to address the threats in, in hopes of preserving the reforms that are the essence of the new republic. You know, and the leadership of the First Order, on the other hand, um, you know, in the, the film, it's kind of like they physically blow up the system, but they're really trying to, you know, it's kind of symbolic of the fact that they just, you know, they just try to wipe the government off the map, which they do. They take Star Killer Base, and then that just leaves the uh, the ragtag remnants of the resistance as the really the only remaining vestige of democratic power. But it's interesting because some of the characters um, in the newer sequel trilogy, they're a little more conscious of the political system that's going on. You know, kind of the original characters are kind of the the hero's journey, the the mythological people. Um, and this one, they're, um, you know, like there's two characters who are introduced in The Last Jedi, which is the second film of the sequel trilogy, especially um, Rose and Paige Tico. And they come from a planet that was strip mined for the, by the First Order um, for raw materials for weapons. And then their planet is used um, to test the weapons on. So it's really traumatic and horrible. Um, this childhood experience gave uh, you know, Rose and Paige are really healthy antagonism against the First Order, and that motivates them to join the resistance. And Rose, uh, I really love her, and she's like the one of the most class conscious of the new Star Wars characters. Uh, she really resents the wealthy people who profit off the war industry and the, the suffering of the press. You know, there's a scene where they go to this um, casino and racetrack, which is called Canto Bite in The Last Jedi. And... Um, she and another character, Finn, are observing the really decadent wealth of the casino denizens. And Finn's really attracted to their beauty and opulence. And the film is interesting, kind of evokes Batista era, Havana, Cuba, with rampant gambling and pleasure-seeking wealthy people. And Finn asks Rose why she hates the place so much. And she answers, you know, and who do you think these people are? There's only one business in the galaxy that will get you this rich. And then Finn kind of gets what she means and says, war. And she said, selling weapons to the First Order. So um, she's kind of talking about, you know, how the wealthy people are funding the war, getting wealthy on it. And then um, kind of there's this, you know, it's beautifully opulent. But I mean, underneath that all, all there's like portrayal of child labor. There's scared kids. They're working in the racetrack stables. There's no adults around taking care of them. Um, they're really kind of left on their own. They're treated brutally. And the First Order are also portrayed as being capable of pretty much, you know, nearly every kind of atrocity. And, you know, Star Wars characters have, you know, suffered trauma at their hands. And, um, you know, kind of it's character driven. So, you know, how they deal with that is the main focus of the plot. But also since uh, there's been so much surfacing of what's going on with the political conflict over the, the three trilogies, you know, it's, it's there's bound to be in the plot some, you know, resolution of the political conflict, uh, hopefully in the upcoming third film. So we don't know what shape that's going to take yet. But, uh, you know, it's interesting to speculate, you know, will the galaxy try this kind of third time to attempt to set up this uh, republic government or will there be more of a people's movement? You know, it's kind of like these different characters talking about these different issues. You know, will there be maybe a more people driven revolutionary mandate for change? You know, we could get kind of a, a galactic wide, um, you know, revol you know, maybe a revolution. <laughs> so um, The Last Jedi kind of hit, hints at this future that's um, created by oppressed common people. Um, they kind of end the film with the hopes displayed by the exploited children of Canto Bight. Um, they show um, one of the stable boys that kind of been ignited by the spark of the resistance. Um, 
and in the final scene of the film, he, he displays this ring that was given to him by Rose, which conceals the emblem of the resistance. It's um, really kind of beautiful. The camera focuses on it. You get the sense that, you know, even the common people have, you know, started to take ownership in this, pro you know, this process of like overthrowing the first order, which is kind of exciting. That's not just driven by the heroes that everybody knows and loves. And so in another echo of contemporary current events, the, the sequel trilogy seems to have really anticipated even our current political environment. Um, you know, even though it was creation was begun several years before the 2016 election. Um, as a result, it's been interesting. It's the movement opposed to Trumpism, you know, in conservative politics. A lot of people call themselves members of the resistance. Um, protests often feature, you know, Princess Leia on posters, especially during the women's marches. So a lot of people have kind of, you know, taken on those emblems for themselves in real life, which is really interesting. If you search on social media, a lot of people use the resistance emblem as their avatar too, which is kind of interesting. And then, um, you know, it's, you know, the reception of the film, you know, it actually kind of, um, it ran into a lot of like um, reactionaries. Um, a lot of people really opposed kind of the political message of the films and also the fact that slowly, they're, you know, it's not perfect, but they're starting to get more visibly diverse, more visibly female. Um, there's been a real backlash to that. Um, you know, it's just kind of shows, you know, um, you know, people who aren't centered in the narrative as much anymore are starting to feel like, you know, they need to fight back. It's kind of been prompted some interesting wars online. Uh, some of them have been pretty terrible. Um, when The Force Awakens came out, you know, John Boyega, you know, his character of Finn, he's a you know stormtrooper. He's he's black. He plays a major role in the story, and he had so much racist abuse hurled at him. There's like a hashtag that came out of 4chan. Uh, it was really bad, and then. Daisy Ridley, who plays the character of Ray, one of the protagonists is a woman. Woman. She was forced to delete her social media after The Force Awakens, after she expressed an opinion of, you know, being in favor of limiting firearms, you know, to limit gun violence. And then with The Last Jedi, it got even worse with, um, you know, Kelly Marie Tran, who plays Rose Tico. Um, she's Vietnamese, and she was, you know, a lot of people just didn't like her character, just, you know, they tried to say, you know, it was for one thing or another, but I mean, she really had the most outspoken political views in the film and she was subjected, you know, the actress, not just the character, but the actress was subjected to months of really vile, racist and misogynistic abuse. And then she had to delete her social media too. And, um, you know, she later even penned a really beautiful op-ed in the New York Times, you know, talking about issues of identity and oppression, which is, really been things that uh, have surfaced, you know, just talking in the in the current real life political climate that we're living in. Um, you know, so it, it just kind of to wrap up, it's like the original trilogy's films was kind of a narrative of the struggle between good and evil, um, but it's taken on this more like pointed political character in the more recent films. And the creation of the new films have, you know, embraced a more diverse view of the future you know, which reflects, you know, the more diverse political co coalitions that, you know, are kind of currently making up the real life resistance in the United States. And, um, you know, while the both the real and the fictional realms both face these like reactionary backlash from groups unwilling to give up their power, um, you know, it just really seems like expanding the struggle to be the most in inclusive, you know, in either the films and in real life, you know, kind of points to the only political path really that we have in front of us that's going to be the most effective. And uh, I'll just end with this quote I really liked. Um, there's this, it's a kid's cartoon, it's called Star Wars Resistance, but it's it was kind of an interesting quote the other day for a kid's show. And it was, um, you know, General Leah Ghana. she's, you know, on board her ship and she's talking to someone and she says, the resistance doesn't belong to me alone. I help guide it but everyone can play a part in it. And I think that's really a wonderful and hopeful message to kind of take out of the, the political themes of, of Star Wars. So I'll just go ahead and end there. Thanks, Michelle. Um, 
I think we'll open the uh, floor for a few questions uh, right now about Michelle's presentation before we move on to Chauncey's. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the raised hand icon under the attendees uh, uh, bar of your control panel, uh, or you can uh, write in uh, and we'll transmit your questions to the presenters. Um, I do have one question here from uh, Jules in Ohio saying, uh, interesting quote, Michelle, democracies are not taken over, they are given away. Uh, would love to hear uh, more explanation. Well, that was, yeah, it's George Lucas's opinion. And, um, you know, I think he reflected that in the prequel trilogy films where he felt like everyone was so complacent. Uh, they kind of lost faith in the process of democracy. Um, and it wasn't so much the the violent act that was uh, taking over the, the political system so much as people's apathy and not really recognizing what they, they had and valuing it. And they just kind of let it slip from between their fingers. So I think he was trying to say that, um, you know, you have to kind of keep an active um, hand in democracy. You have to be aware of what's going on. Um, and not be complacent to the point where you just kind of let it slip away and create this vacuum where, you know, people who just want power for the sake of power or, you know, power for the sake of profit can kind of just move in without any resistance whatsoever. I think that's what he was trying to say. Anybody else? That's it. <laughs> okay. Um, it looks like Scott is muted. So let's see if there are any other. This is D. <laughs> let's see if there are any other questions. Uh, does anyone else have a question? If you, uh, Scott is very handy. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, please uh, verbalize your question if you have one. Cindy, your mic is open. Cindy, your mic. Hi, this is Cindy from Baltimore, and thank you, Michelle. Um, so, a uh, quick question. So, you say Nixon was trying to create discontent and dissatisfaction in the populace. <clears throat> I certainly can see that that has happened, and I think it's a fascinating thought, and it's not necessarily something that you uh, want to get into tonight, but it's something that I think that we should look at how was he so successful and why is dissatisfaction such an alienating thing instead of the way that we use dissatisfaction, which is to gather together and right. fight it as a, as a unit. I just mm -hmm. think that's a fascinating point. The other is um, I, I think it's so reasonable to have unsureness at the beginning of socialist rule but I'm wondering if there's any um, clues in the Star Wars or in the Lucas vision about how you get past that. And I, I, I ha would have to say my own opinion is that you've got to have the dictatorship of the proletariat. And that's what people find so hard to accept. That mm -hmm. some, some part of the class has to be in control. I mean, the working class has got to be in control. And um, and then and then I also think it brings up questions. What you talk, what you said brings up questions about the breakup of the USSR. And I'm really hoping that this summer that we will be looking back at that because I think there's been enough time that's passed that we can look back at that and really get some valuable lessons that we can share with the populace. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Hold on, Michelle, and we'll. There's one more um, that I see very quickly. Bill, your mic is open. <clears throat> okay, well, I actually typed the question. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, this is Bill from Detroit. Uh, thank you for your report on Star Wars. I was curious, how much authority does Lucas, did George Lucas have with the uh, capitalist studio bosses? And, uh, and why hasn't, uh, has he been a progressive publicly or uh, at all, or stated has been involved in any progressive activity? Uh he, there's, I think there's a few chunks in there. I'll take the first one. Uh, he sold Lucasfilm off to Disney, uh, which is kind of controversial a few years ago, but um, he had kind of gotten tired of running it. 
and um, he sold it for $4 billion. So he's a very wealthy man and he's a liberal. So, I mean, his politics are liberal and the politics of Star Wars tend to be, it's going back to kind of what Cindy was saying earlier, the conflicts that arise between the, the political factions tend to be people who think there should be more centralized power and people who think that the power should be more devolved to the individual planets. So I feel like this is kind of a, the struggle for an idea within Star Wars is kind of a push and pull between this kind of anxiety that people have over what does socialism mean? You know, is it like, you know, is it more power to the people? Is it more centralized? Is, you know, is more centralized mean more power to the people? You know, we grapple with those questions all the time. Um, so that that's kind of, you know, not resolved in Star Wars as well, which is interesting. Um, the other part of your question, is George Lucas a progressive? He's, he's, he's definitely a liberal. He's a very big in the Bay Area, I think mostly in philanthropy. I don't think he gets involved directly in politics himself, but um, I know he, he, he definitely identifies as, you know, um, not wanting corporations and, and democracy to be controlled by capitalism. But at the same time, you know, he, he's been involved in that system. So whatever, that kind of makes him, but he's definitely not a conservative in the in the sense that he's not right wing and he doesn't identify with the Republican Party. So I hope that kind of answers your question. I think Scott is going to rejoin us um, now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, we have. Uh, it looks like a few more questions uh, here um, from Norma, Yusuf, and Tony. Um, so we'll, uh, move through those and then, um, uh, further questions we'll hold for, uh, after, uh, Chauncey's presentation. Um, Norma, your, your mic is, your mic is open, Norma. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm 83, 84 years old, and I've never watched any Star Wars. It's not the kind that appeals to me. I read science fiction endlessly for years, um, 40, 50, 60 years ago, <laughs> and firmly uh, used, incorporated those into my communist thinking. I was born communist. I'm a born again communist. So those ideas uh, were always substantive. The, the science fiction ideas were substantive for me. So you kept saying, you know, you know, which is a rather interrupting kind of thing going on, constantly saying, you know, you know. <clears throat> I don't know. So I was really listening to you and appreciated the very uh, reasonable summaries that you gave. Uh, not knowing, not having to watch the movies, a big help for me. I know a lot of people enjoyed it, but they're seeing it as as I read the same with the same open feeling that I read science fiction so many years ago. So uh, I was glad to hear your description, but I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Great comment. Uh, um. Yusuf, Yusuf, your mic is open. Uh, Yusuf Gursi, uh, your mic is open if you're, if you can uh, share your question. Oh, 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 yes, uh, he, you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, in the first Star Wars uh, film, what put me off uh, from a Marxist point of view, was uh, you had a, a, a conflict between a, a uh, what uh, looks like a feudal society uh, a versus uh, small farmers uh, it, 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 together with very advanced technology. Uh, but uh, it seems that in the subsequent uh, films, uh, the understanding has. Uh, evolved uh, and uh, the first criticism is the criticism I think of weakness of many science fiction uh, genres uh, 
frequent criticism uh, uh, of, of science fiction. Uh, but do you know if anything made uh, uh, George Lucas evolve in his understanding? And uh, would you care to comment on this further? Uh, I don't know if he's gone through his specific thought process. I think that in when he first started writing Star Wars, he he was commenting on the political situation, but I think he was also kind of hearkening to, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the whole thing that he's been involved in, with uh, Joseph Campbell and mythology. So I think that sort of he dragged in the, the uh, uh, vocabulary of, of mythology, which has princesses and you know, princes and gods and things like that. So that, that, that was kind of put over the top kind of as a veneer um, as he explored this kind of updating of the, the hero's journey um, following, you know, Luke, especially as kind of like the hero who develops his, um, you know, his sense of himself and becomes the hero from a farm boy. Um, so I don't know that he meant anything really overt by having the remnants of the aristocracy there. Uh, and I think that's kind of why it's kind of gotten shed along the way because, um, you know, the people who are selected to be heroes now are more of the common people, unless it's kind of like chosen people, you know, Luke, who's like the son of this great man, Darth Vader, Leia, who's the princess, his sister. Um, it's getting a little more democratized. Um, I don't know what specifically spurred that change, but that's that's kind of my thoughts on it. Thank you. All right, uh, one final uh, question for this section uh, from uh, Tony. Tony, your mic is open. Tony? Tony Gorea, uh, your mic is open if you'd care to share your question. All right, well, perhaps we can uh, Pick him up Come later. back to Tony at the end then. Um, and I know we have a, we received a couple of other questions as well, and uh, we'll uh, come back to them after uh, uh, Chauncey's done her presentation and answered a couple of questions. So uh, thank you very much, Michelle and uh, Chauncey. Uh, take it away. Okay. Hi. Thanks, Michelle, for that about Star Wars. I'm not, I don't really, I haven't really watched a lot of them. I think I watched the original three and I have some friends who are really into the new ones. And I saw a lot of that controversy around um, uh, the actors and whatnot, which, you know, sometimes happens, right? When like things are infused with, like, I, I wanted, one of the things I wanted was going to touch on, you know, when it comes to um, <clears throat> who gets to be in, you know, films and representation and things of that nature and who gets to tell the stories of film. Um, <clears throat> and I'll be focusing in on horror because it's one of my favorite genres. And there's a reason for that in terms of why horror is one of my favorite genres, which has to do with politics. Although people like to think that film should be, you know, sometimes apolitical, especially certain genre films such as science fiction or horror and things of that nature. Um, one of the quotes that stand out to me that I've always uh, thought about is uh, Alice Walker, who is like an, who is American novelist and poet and activist said, you know, if art doesn't make us better, then what on earth is it for? And I, you know, I think film plays into that as well, because art is powerful. Uh, it's a great use of the imagination and storytelling is a part of that. And messaging is a way to put forth ideas and thoughts in a way that reaches many. And you know that's the that's a powerful tool that film can be that tell that this medium of storytelling can be. And you know one of the things I want to relate this to is how we, as you know, people who are progressives, people who are you know fighting for a better world, a world we want to see, use this medium as well, the genre and things of that nature. Um, you know, with film and television, that's not you know separate and apart from messaging. This medium is one in which stories can be put forth. You know, they can be progressive, and in that same vein, just as a lot of aspects of media can be used in a toxic sense, in the sense of pushing forth the status quo and others of you know of oppression and things that are very much embedded in the in a capitalist society that we're a part of. Um, and you know, ideas such as gender, race, religion, labor, et cetera, are can be littered throughout film and television 
in ways that can be overt and are ways that are a little bit more subtle. And, and it's a great way to reach people where, you know, people can be entertained, but they can also get messaging that can empower them to go out into society um, to take a, a different look at, at, at different things. You know, we saw that in relating it to horror when it came to uh, Jordan Peele's Get Out. And, you know, this is, you know, some people, you know, Jordan Peele actually said it, he considered it a documentary as more as opposed to a horror um, situation. And one of the things with it um, was that Get Out was, for those who don't know, was a story about a young black man dating a uh, white woman. And the idea of what, you know, the dynamics, the racial dynamics of that, and that there was, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't watched it, you know, a certain danger. Um, now in the movie, you know, he does it in a horror kind of way, but we also know there are horrors, you know, within American history, within U.S. history and, you know, history of the world when it comes to interracial dynamics, when it comes to race and oppression and what Jordan Peele has done, and he's not the first to do it within the horror genre and with the, within film in general, it's using a real world situation and placing it in a film to reflect it in a way that, you know, um, People can take it in as a story, but also take away messaging within it, I think. And this was done in a more progressive way, right? You know, what he wanted to do with Get Out was put the idea of race relations of, in America after Obama with the upcoming, at that time, upcomingness of, you know, Trump and what we were dealing with in that sense. And, you know, this isn't a new phenomenon of a film being used in, in such a way. And it also is a new phenomenon that film can be used in a way of pushing a status quo that is problematic and toxic. You know, one thing that comes to me was um, when I had to watch for a film studies class uh, when I took drama back in high school was uh, The Birth of a Nation, which is a film that came out in uh, 1915. It was about three hours long. Uh, it was a silent film and it was considered American epic silent film. And one of the things is by D.W. Griffith. And I don't know if people have, uh, you know, he was a famous like American filmmaker and whatnot. And what this film did was it had white people in blackface. It used the idea of the black man as some type of sexual predator. Um, it was reflecting the uh, radical reconstruction era where in a very negative light of how, you know, black people were taking over uh, the, uh, you know, politics and whatnot. They were eating fried chicken and things of that nature. And, um, you know, just very stereotypical things. And one of the things that it did was that it glorified the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Klan. You know, it was this idea of, you know, this great knight who was going to return the US to, you know, its great glory, you know, of protecting the white woman, uh, vanquishing the evil monster of the black man and uh, the black women harlots and things of that nature. And, you know, this was a film that was considered, actually became a box office success for its time. And in comparison to other films after it, you know, it was very, you know, it's still considered a very big, um, financially speaking, um, a success. It was also the first film that was screened in the White House, you know, and, you know, this was the film, you know, Woodrow Wilson screened it, you know, the NAACP at the time did a huge campaign against it and failed to get it banned in theaters. And so this film was put out and in a way it, you know, it pushed, it legitimized um, this idea of what essentially is a hate group, the KKK of being some type of hero. And, you know, and no doubt, even now to this day, you know, there are some film critics, legitimized film critics who consider it, you know, a masterpiece, you know, film critics who, because, and one of the things I want to talk about is who gets to legitimize film, who gets to say that a film is um, great and has great messaging and things of, you know, at that time, you know, predominantly in the film criticism industry, it's, you know, uh, majority white men. And, when we look at that in terms of messaging and what gets put out there and the status quo being upheld, the people who get to criticize or get to legitimize something can off, can sometimes be the people who benefit from the status quo in some in some kind of way. So that also gets into the aspect of you know deciding on whose uh, input and voices and leadership is valuable when it comes to messaging, when it comes to what we put out there into our mediums 
such as film and television. Uh, one of the things, um, and, and honing in on that, that was that was a very uh, that was a large that was an extreme example of a, a film that was just overtly toxic. Although there's others, I'm sure people have named where they have seen a film and it's like, yeah, what was that kind of messaging? If you're you know look at that sort of thing, and sometimes it's more subtle where people are getting messaging and they don't even realize they're getting it right. And um, and this comes with um, in the horror genre, which is one of my favorites. And, and sometimes it gets dismissed as uh, in the last couple of years, you know, we had Jordan Pill who won an Oscar for the script, uh, for the script of, of Get Out and whatnot. But, you know, horror sometimes gets dismissed as a genre that has, you know, just, you know, simple monsters. And it's just sometimes depending on what kind of horror you watch, it's like blood, guts, gore, and boobs and, and things of that nature. And so, but one of the things I believe, and I think if you look at the history of the horror genre is that it really is a genre that gives the space and the ability in terms of the kind of themes in it to reflect, um, to hold a mirror up to society in some ways um, to, and sometimes it's a warped mirror, mirror or sometimes the mirror, you know, shows the warpedness of our society of, you know, what the real monsters can be in terms of what affects us as a people, um, as a society. And horror at times has done that. Um, and not just, you know, with the mythical, a mythological creature of what goes bump into the night. But a lot of times, if, if, if when, a, when a horror picture is really good, I think it reflects um, real world issues in a fantastical way, but in a way that, you know, puts it right in front of your face if you look, you know, well enough into it. And I think if even if you're not into horror or anything like that, you, you, you've probably seen some of them. Um, even in, in even horror pictures that you didn't think had certain political messaging. You know, I mentioned Get Out. Another one is They Live um, by John Carpenter, which came out in 1988, I believe. And, you know, that one was very much about uh, challenging when John Carpenter, one of the interviews he had about it was saying basically that this was a middle finger to Reagan to the idea of, you know, Reaganomics and what was going through what was happening to working people, to the poor. And you see that overtly because in They Live, the plot line is basically um, the ruling class, uh, the wealthy are alien, are an alien species that are basically um, there to exploit and get working people to conform and obey. And, you know, it's, you minus the alien species part of that, you know, description. And it can very much be a reflection of our own um, society in terms of the the ruling class and and the wealthy and what they, you know, them wanting you know uh, working people not to think for themselves, not to challenge the status quo and things of that nature. You also have more recent films like The Purge, which uh, one of the most recent it's a franchise, a horror franchise, and one of the most recent installments. One of the things about The Purge is that for one night, you know, the world is uh, uh, the U.S. in particular is able to do a night where people just go out and everything's legal, including murder. And one of the recent ones, the first Purge, which deals with the origins of the franchise, was the idea that the ex before this was a popular phenomenon in the franchise where it was totally accepted by society, there was a uh, party that was elected to uh the white house which were called the uh the new fathers or something and it was very much reflective of like trump of this whole idea of returning making america great again and the experiment of the purge they used it on a working class working poor community first and had the world watch to see if these people would start killing each other and things of that nature and you know it was this idea of you know in this sense reflecting you know what the government or depending on in the wrong hands can do in terms of working people and and um how they're exploited uh to for for political gains and things of that nature then you have other more uh back in the day type films such as you know night of the living dead in 1968 by george romero which you know one of the first films that subverted the horror genre in the sense of having you know a black male as a uh, protagonist, a strong woman character, things of that nature. But there were zombies, right? But 
the zombies weren't the main, wasn't really the focus. It was more so the real monsters were the, what happens when people, when there's chaos, what happens when, um, when some people are given power and things of that nature. And, and also, you know, showing representation because there's layers when it comes to um, film. It's not just who's in front of the camera. It's who's getting to tell the stories. It's who's getting to talk about the stories. Um, a lot of people we know about Godzilla, you know, but many people, the 1954 version, but many people don't, you know, may not know. I don't want to say many people, but people may not know that that was actually a reflection of Japan making commentary on the devastation of the atomic bomb that, you know, ravaged during uh, World War II. You know, here's this great big monster or whatever. And, you know, people could take that at face value, but there's also something deeper going into that. So, you know, it's just the power of a, a film and whatnot. And, you know, and the one I saw recently, such as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was a film where on the surface, it looks like a, wild, a chainsaw wielding maniac, basically killing these unsuspecting young people who happen to have their car break down. But in reality, you know, when you really look at the film, and it's not just like what the director says it's about afterwards, you can see it in the film, right? Um, if you watch this, uh, where one of the issues it deals with is what happens when an industry up and leaves a town. You know, a lot of the people there were meat packers and meat cutters and things of that nature. And then, you know, the corporation up and left and then they had no way to work. So what happens? They, you know, this is an extreme view. They start killing some people and start meat cutting that way. But it's this idea of what happens when you know, a town is left without in devastation after a company that they, you know, depended on for so long goes away. And also one of the things that the director of this, of Texas Chainsaw Massacre was, uh, was talking about, there's a theme throughout of the radio playing and what the news is saying to people. And his, you know, one of the things when this came out um, in 19, I think it was late 1970s, it's, the marketing ploy was that it was based on a true story. And, you know, you found out later, it's not based on a true story. It's a composite of different killers, but he was actually playing on the question of truth when it comes to mass media. You know, one of the things he talked about was the lies he thought that the government and whatnot were pushing about the Vietnam War. And the fact that, you know, one of the things was that there was so much censorship on his film and trying to get it out. But then, you know, there's these, images of war and things and, and whatnot going on. And it's like, well, you know, you can show these real life, you know, brutality and things of that nature, but here's a film that's fictional, you know, or sort of based on a thing. And yet I'm, you know, I'm not allowed to, you know, um, have that freedom of, of, the, of that space, but also the idea of, um, of truth telling when it comes to what people are told um, from, you know, those in power. And, you know, there's a salute. I mean, I can name a good amount of other horror films, but I, you know, I use those as an example of the power that filmmaking have, particularly one that can often get dismissed. I mean, I guess one in particular I wanted to bring out was Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, what, the earlier one of, uh, I believe it was the 19, late 1950s, 19, 1956, which, you know, there's a debate on what exactly it's about, but one of the things that the director of that film said was that it was dealing with the paranoia of the McCarthy era and this idea of you know everyone being paranoid feeling like they have to act the same no one's allowed to speak out essentially becoming pod people which the plot line of invasion of the body snatchers was that there was this alien entity or whatnot that came about and basically cloned people and became them you know but that's a very simple plot line, but really the underlying themes of that is this idea of the paranoia of the McCarthyism um, era and what was going on there and how people were very, how there was a witch hunt going on. And um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers is actually a reflection of that in a, in a very awesome way, you know, which can be relatable for people to take in, but also not feel as though they're getting, you know, bludgeoned over the head with um, messaging. Or whatnot, and you know, even with that, there are shortcomings in film, and in the film industry. You know, one of those being, as I was leaning towards the fact of who gets to tell these stories. You know, it's still a very white male-dominated industry, um, and also, you know, like other films, it it can become from the male gaze. And when I say the male gaze, you know, I'm talking about the idea of who is the film made for. You know, and I could say in particular to like horror. 
you know, for all its, you know, progressive plot lines and stuff. Sometimes there is gratuitous violence against women. There are shots where for whatever reason, when a woman is killed or dies, she has to do it with her top off, things of that nature that can alienate, you know, women um, viewers who, who want to, you know, see, see this messaging, but also, you know, see it without feeling like they're on the, the menu in terms of, you know, being exploited. And, you know, there's also the, the question of, of politics in films and not just horror, but all in other things. I've, I've gotten into many debates where people are like, no politics when it comes to something. Like they just want horror. They just want science fiction. But what is that? What does that mean? You know, everything is, you know, political. And in that sense, messaging isn't in a vacuum. So it's either, you know, by saying you want something not political, that's political in and of itself, because it's like, why don't you want this messaging in here? What are you trying to keep others from learning and finding out? Um, and we also know when people are represented in film and are able to tell their stories that they feel empowered as well. And, and that's why, you know, I think we're seeing a resurgence of, and this actually actually connects to um, Michelle's presentation with um, Star Wars, where, you know, there was this big flack when Finn and others who's like African, he's, um, he's black, <clears throat> came about. And, you know, we see this in, in, in this idea of people can talk about aliens and monsters and things like that, but you can't have a black person in space or you can't have a black person fight a monster or something of that nature. But, you know, studies have shown when people see themselves, they feel empowered. And, you know, it's one of the things it's called the CSI effect. And I don't know if people watch shows like CSI and CSI Miami, it's forensics, it's a forensic show and whatnot. And they saw that there was an increase of young of young women and women going into the forensics field because they were seeing themselves on TV in the field, you know, and it's the same thing of um, stereotypes when it comes to people of color and women, you know, if, if all the woman sees herself as it's a love interest, all the black person sees themselves is as a thug or or whatnot. It does not feel empowering. So it's a question of when we think about the medium and our messaging and using the medium as activists, as 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 people wanting to see, wanting to reflect the world we want to be in, it's about who gets to tell those stories as well and in what ways. Um, you know, like I was saying, I'm a, you know, one of the things I do is film criticism. And I, you know, it was mentioned earlier that I, you know, my stuff is approved through Rotten Tomatoes. But, you know, one of the things that was a push for diversity because for a time, this big website that helps to determine, you know, because film criticism isn't just someone with an opinion necessarily. I mean, sometimes it is someone with just an opinion, but it also is analysis. And this analysis can determine if a film is able to be successful, if films like it are able to be successful. And what happens when you have like a white male dominated um, sector deciding if stories that maybe might be predominantly woman led, might be predominantly person of color led, may talk about politics that challenge the status quo, challenges a person's um, you know, position in society. And then they get to, you know, wax poetic about, oh, this just wasn't a good film without looking at the layers of why that is, then it stifles the progress of filmmaking. It stifles the progress of empowering, um, you know, different voices in, in, in this medium that can be so powerful. And it is a powerful medium because we do know with the news, the radio and film and whatnot that, the right wing is very much about consolidating, you know, one of the things was like news radio that they do and, and things of that nature, getting their messaging out. So it's important to value what we as activists, what we as, you know, people, um, a part of, uh, you know, part of a struggle for a more progressive, you know, society um, and, and against capitalism, of course, um, can do in utilizing this media and seeing the ways that it's not just a, it's not just a hobby. It's not just something that people do when they want to stop thinking about, about politics and that it's something that's constantly, you know, either reinforcing the status quo or challenging it. And um, yeah, I just I guess that was a brief thing of I could talk more about horror. I can go on for a lot about horror. But um, yeah, I just I think the way I think about the topic is how we use what we know to uh, apply it to our activism. And I think um, there's ways in doing that and empowering voices and in challenging um, and, and challenging who gets to dominate in, in those fields and whatnot, so.
Thank you, Chauncey. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to ask our presenters if they'd be okay uh, sticking around for a, a few more minutes. We're approaching our, our slated ending time of nine. Uh, we, we do have some more questions and I, I think discussion. Um, would that be possible for, uh, for you too, Chauncey and Michelle? Yeah, fine. Okay. Maybe about mm -hmm. like 20 more minutes, I think. Oh, yeah, um, 15 minutes probably with that. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we're going to stick around for another uh, 15 minutes and um, move through some more questions. Again, if you have a question, uh, you may uh, you can put your hand up uh, with the little raised hand icon, and I will call on you. Um, I think uh, we have a question that was sent in uh, after Michelle's presentation, but I think um, is is germane to both from uh, Lamont, who who asks about the parallels uh, between Trumpism and the First Order uh, that mm -hmm. Michelle mentioned, um, and asks, how do you think the future will look for the American resistance to conservative ideology that's growing? Um, so uh, maybe if we could have Chauncey uh, start off on that, and then and then Michelle. Okay. Um, how will the future of the resistance look? Is that yeah, the question? Um, you know, what, what's happening in, in movies right now and the, the trends? Well, I think, you know, one of you, you see this rhetoric sometimes from like, especially right wing um, conservative types who are like, you know, Hollywood's so liberal and all they do is like, but we, you know, we saw with the Me Too and others that it's not like some perfect Christine place or whatever, where there's no oppression and marginalization and things. But we are, I think, seeing, but also like example of the Me Too movement and others, uh, we're seeing, you know, people feeling empowered enough to challenge, um, the way things are and to want to get their voices heard. I mean, it's not a perfect, this isn't a perfect movement, but you know, we are seeing like women directors, you know, fighting for more, for better pay, fighting to be able to direct more stories that are, are women led and whatnot. And I think as we see, I think that's a reflection of what's happening outside of the industry as well. People wanting their voices to be heard. We're seeing, you know, what we saw with the midterm, with the midterm elections was, you know, people focusing in on, the issues, not necessarily just, you know, a person or something like galvanizing behind a person, but galvanizing behind issues and wanting and grassroots campaigns, you know, fighting for, you know, what they thought would be um, what they feel would be important issues to, to rally behind, as opposed to looking for a savior or something of that nature. And I think, you know, we're, we're seeing that in film too, people wanting their voices to be heard more, more often than not. And I think that's that 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 theme of empowerment is is definitely something that I think will continue if it, if it's given the space to. Yeah, and I mean, just taking up from that, I mean, what Chauncey was saying in her presentation was so great. I mean, it's just like people want to see themselves in films, and I think you know, it's more and more. Uh, we do start to see you know little cracks starting to form, or films are starting to you know bring in, um, you know, characters that aren't just the, the white hero, um, you know, we've got like Black Panther, you know, Wonder Woman, we've got these like women led, you know, African American or black, uh, you know, kind of films that feature the characters that aren't just the, the white male hero. I mean, I think people have shown that there's a huge, you know, response just not socially, but I mean, even economically, I mean, it's like those, those films did great, you know, and people really want to see those. So I think there's going to be more and more pressure from audiences to be like, you know, you're going to have to, you know, bring up the level on this. You can't just keep churning out the same thing over and over again. You know, um, I think audiences is, you know, there'll probably always be an audience for like another Superman film, you know, not that I'm dogging on Superman, but you know, it's just kind of like, you know, people are going to want to see more and they're going to get bored with the the same old cookie cutter thing. And I, um, you know, I'm just hoping that we can kind of bring, you know, more diverse directors, you know, more diverse producers, you know, and make sure that people really have like a, a piece of that industry too. You know, it's, it's not just being led by the same two or three people, which sometimes it can feel like, um, so that's just kind of my thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, uh, our next question is from Brad. Uh, Brad, your microphone is open. Uh, 
Brad, are you there? Nope. Nope. Moving on to uh, Darren. Darren, your microphone is open. Hello. How are you doing, Chauncey? How are you doing, Michelle? Hi. Um, um, so I I wanted to make kind of since we were talking about like how the how something like the the last Jedi and the concept of resistance plays into our real world policies and our real world resistance, I think the ending of the movie kind of offers us a path forward. Generally, Star Wars is kind of about has traditionally been about, and this is what like you know the the ranty fanboys didn't like. It's about chosen people. It's about the special, the one special, the one, the special hero that comes in with their lightsaber and fixes everything. But at the end of at the end of the movie, you have Luke kind of um, fading out, fading out into the background, and then you have these kids who who are basically like basically saying the force is with everyone. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we should take away from that is that you don't have to be a chosen person to be able to stand up against reactionary fascism or or stand up for for liberty and human rights. You just because that force is with with within everybody because it 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 springs from what everyone has in common to because I believe that people are naturally inclined to not be to be against oppression and injustice. So that's just so that's just what I kind of wanted to add. I wanted to add something because because I got caught up in stuff after I joined, so I'm a little late. I'm sorry. No, that's really, great. Thank you. Yeah. No, good comments. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that's definitely the message we should take away. And I think we do see that in real life. I think, you know, in the last couple of years, people, you know, common people have just been like, I never really thought I could do anything, but here I am. I'm calling my congressperson. I'm running for office. I'm doing this stuff. I mean, it's like people who've just come out of the movement who weren't like part of the established political system or, you know, they're just, people are just going for it, which I, I think is kind of reflected in, you know, which I thought was really cool. It was kind of reflected in, in Star Wars too. Um, see, uh, our next question is for um, Tony, uh, who I believe uh, has had his question since the uh, first, uh, first section. Tony, your mic is open. Hi there. Can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, I suppose a comment and question for each speaker. The original comment I had was uh, Michael Parenti was very critical of the underlying theme and narrative of the original Star Wars movies. And he writes and talks about it being praised by um, cold warriors because the evil empire was supposed to represent the Soviet Union and the kind of liberal representation of totalitarianism, uh, overcoming the individual and the individual has to fight back and the empire are, are half robotic and they're lacking human values and the individual uh, overcomes them. So he sees it as a, as a Cold War themed movie. Uh, hmm. I tend to agree. Uh, I'm not familiar with the latest Star Wars movies. And I'm also, I might sound like a curmudgeon for saying this, but. I really can't look to big Hollywood corporate productions for seeing any kind of uh, help for people trying to overthrow the system. I mean, nowadays they, they tie in kind of uh, more humanistic themes, but I think the underlying messages of the Star Wars films, for example, aren't progressive in my view. So I'll ask the speaker to comment on that. And for the second speaker, Shaanxi, the my understanding of the original uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers was and maybe I misinterpreted what you said, but it wasn't a criticism of McCarthyism. It was McCarthyism in action. And the idea of the Soviets and the, and the foreign communists who will infiltrate American society without anyone knowing it, and they're all kind of robotic and lacking human values, and they're just a big Borg character that has no individualism. 
and the lone, the protagonist, no one will listen to him that this is happening. And the, th and the idea was, if you don't listen to the McCarthyites, they're going to get in this way. So uh, I saw those th two things as, as anti, uh, anti-communist films. So uh, I'll ask both of you if you can uh, comment on that. Thank you very much. Chauncey, do you want to open up? Chauncey, you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, with the that that's why I said earlier about the invasion of the body snatchers, uh, invasion of the body snatchers, that it was more so a debate. The director eventually did say that it was dealing more so with the paranoia around McCarthyism. Um, although, you know, and that's the thing about films. It's like, you know, it leaves open messaging, but I think there is also in looking at the source, you know, the people who actually directed it, who had the messaging of what they were actually trying to, you know, convey with it. Um, you know, like for example, with, so I don't think the Invasion of Body Snatcher, and there was other Invasion of Body Snatcher movies that dealt with other stuff. I don't think it was like, like anti comedy I think it was more so like the, I, I, I take it more so what the director was saying about the paranoia uh, of playing on the paranoia, the McCarthyism. Um, era. Um, I think, like, for example, with They Live, I gave straight up when I said, uh, John Carpenter said this was a thing about Reaganomics, this was a middle finger to Reagan and the whole idea of the 1% of the wealthy. Um, and you had people who still to this day determine it as this is against this the government and they want to take my guns. Like, I mean, there's different interpretations, but I think in looking at, you know, what the people who actually, you know, were making it said, uh, you know, I kind of go by that a little bit. I put a little bit more weight on that, although I think you can get messaging from it. In terms of uh, looking to big Hollywood for stuff, I, I don't think you can throw baby out with the bathwater when it comes to, uh, that's a horrible analogy, but like, I don't think you can throw all of that out. Um, when looking at some of this messaging, for example, the Get Out film and the idea of race and and relations and things, I I think you know it had some great messaging. And I think if we are to say because it came from you know a company that's able to put it in a lot of theaters, that somehow um, you can't trust it, I think um, that limits us. I mean, I think this goes back to what I'm saying about filmmaking and looking at the medium and not you know um, necessarily just thinking. Um, depending on, I mean, you do sometimes have to follow the money and what the benefit of it is. Um, but I will say like for the horror genre, a lot of things with the horror genre is one of the great, one of the reasons why horror films get made so quickly is because they're very cheap to make. And a lot of time it's a lot of uh, up and coming filmmakers who do it because, you know, they, they can't get necessarily the backing of big budget and, and things of that nature. So you do have, I think you have people who are really just wanting to get a message out there and do that. But I don't think necessarily if something comes from a big corporation um, in the sense of films that, you know, I think you have to look a little bit deeper as, as who's behind it, who's making it and not just the company that's distributing it. And that just goes with just knowing how the film industry of the tech of the film industry works, like who get distribution and all this other stuff that sounds boring. But like, it's 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 a little bit more than just the cut, like Sony putting out a film. You have to look at who wrote the script. You have to look at who's doing the directing, who did the casting, who's in the cast. You know, and that's layers. And that's and that's with a lot of stuff that we do politically, looking at the nuance of something like this, for example, I don't want to open up a can of worms, but the whole idea of Hillary Clinton getting elected, you know, people wanted to throw that out, maybe with the bathwater because of this, that and the other, but not looking at the nuance of what would happen if Trump got elected. We have to as activists, we have to look at the nuance of things, the layers of things um, instead of putting it necessarily in like a box of something that either it can be touched or can't. That's good the response, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, God, can't add much to that. I mean, that's a really good response. Um, for me, just in terms of like, um, you know, Star Wars, I think, you know, yeah, they're big capitalist blockbuster films, but I mean, they're also children's film. They're very popular with children. And I mean, I was seven years old when I saw the very first one, so I wasn't, reacting like Michael Parenti would to, you know, Star Wars. I was reacting as a seven-year-old who, you know, for me, it was very progressive because Princess Leia was one of the first, like, mainstream studio heroines who actually had her own agency. She was kind of a, a hero in the role. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but, you know, she's kind of an active warrior, leader, 
Um, she wasn't talked down to. She wasn't always in distress. It was, it was very different. And then um, uh, even in The Empire Strikes Back, you know, she's the one who rescues Han Solo, where, you know, before it had always been, you know, the other way around. The man always rescues the woman. So for me, that had a huge influence just on the way I started to think about myself, because as a child, you know, you kind of get messages from what's around you. And that's that was a huge message for me at that point to kind of, you know, um, influence the way I grew up. So that being said, you know, I'm, I don't think that those films were, you know, had a great political statement. And that was just what I was trying to say is like in, in the beginning, it was very simplistic, you know, and you're right. The idea of the empire, um, even with George Lucas's politics and being anti Nixon, um, there's even an outtake early on, which didn't make it into the film, but it's interesting where, um, you know, Luke's friend who goes off to, you know, train as a pilot, he's talking about the empire and he's like, you know, the empire is really spreading out, you know, they're, they're starting to nationalize all the industries and he's like, oh my God, you know, so glad I, that didn't make it into the film, but that, that is a point of view of Lucas's, you know, the things like the USSR were also kind of like the evil empire, you know, so some of that got in there, but I think it's, it's interesting kind of like, Lucas, even though, um, you know, he's a liberal, but as more and more people have taken on pieces of Star Wars, and that was what I was trying to say with like some of the supplementary materials and the books that people write, the new directors, and there's new leadership at Star Wars. I'm not saying, you know, the politics are perfect, but I think that they are progressing to, um, you know, more interesting comments on what goes on, you know, like the prequel trilogy being really anti-corporate. Um, you know, having this message about, um, you know, what you can kind of whip up people to do if they lose faith in the government, you know, that was kind of interesting. And then um, just going on to the sequel trilogy where it feels like it was more overt, kind of like if it's not really talking about socialism, it's talking about the power of people's movements, you know, just something we grapple with, you know, in America, you know, it's like, what, what do we work with in coalition, you know, who are the people we can bring together, you know, and who are the people who are going to press to the next level? So for me, that was um, just kind of the, the interesting part of it um, there. Um, you know, so we'll see. I don't I don't know what the third film's going to bring. You know, maybe they'll just go back to the same old, same old. You know, I'd like to think that they progressed the, the next level. But um, it's just interesting that a lot of the creators have started to hint at, like, things happening, like class struggle, the economic problems, labor problems, you know, the criminal enterprise and corruption, and just kind of things that the original trilogy didn't really – uh, have the scope to handle. Thanks very much uh, to both uh, Michelle Kern and Chauncey Robinson, um, who've been our facilitators tonight. Um, our next class will be on January 6th um, uh, on party history, entitled The CPUSA and the US Labor Movement 100 Years, uh, led by Carl Wood. Um, so we invite you to join us then. Uh, we apologize to uh, those of you whose questions we, we didn't have time to get to. Um, uh, this discussion can continue on the cpusa.org website and also the party's Facebook page. Um, we'll have this uh, webinar uh, posted uh, soon, hopefully, and, and we encourage you to keep the discussion going there. Uh, thanks again to Chauncey and uh, Michelle and to all of you who participated. Uh, have a good evening. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Chauncey. Have and a great thank night. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks.